But fossilized bones are not the only remains that can shed light on the life of an animal. There are many other clues that can fill in some crucial details. My concern is the world of T-Rex. What plants did it live with? What sort of foliage hit it while it stalked its prey? What had happened is the flowering plants appeared early in the Cretaceous period, and by the time of Tyrannosaurus rex, they were dominating the world's ecosystems. We find in North Dakota that 90% of our fossil leaves, and we now have over 30,000 fossil leaves collected, over 90% of those fossil leaves are broad-leafed flowering plant leaves. What you see are here broad-leaf relatives of the laurel and cinnamon, relatives, two-lobed relatives of magnolia, relatives of the modern sycamore, relatives of the modern elm. There's still a few conifers around in the time of Tyrannosaurus rex, the bald cypress and its relatives. So the look of the place was similar to, say, perhaps Florida or southern Georgia, where you have relatively small trees, maybe 30, 40, 50 feet tall, trunks no more than maybe a foot in diameter. By the time Tyrannosaurus was living in North America, most of the modern families of plants and animals had already appeared on the Earth. Consequently, the world that Tyrannosaurus lived in may not have been as foreign as we think it is. In fact, we can almost go to parts of the world today and see representatives of those animals and plants still alive today. And you would have crocodiles and turtles and uh, lizards and snakes and all these things. They would have been very familiar to us today. The difference would have been that the large animals, which today are large mammals, at that time would have been dinosaurs. Just as plant-eating animals outnumber meat-eaters today, the plant-eating dinosaurs outnumbered carnivores millions of years ago. Phil Curry is leading a team of scientists excavating a herd of duck-billed plant-eaters called Edmontosaurs. Dinosaurs like these probably were favorite dinners for T. rex. Well, we've got about, uh, I'd say, 65 or so Tyrannosaur teeth, a few small theropods, lots of tooth-marked bone as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's enough Edmontosaurus material in here to uh, indicate that this was a herd of Edmontosaurus? Well, we've got at least um, eight individuals, eight big Edmontosaurs, but we also have evidence of some very small animals based on some of the lower limb bones. So it appears like we've got older adults with smaller individuals, which to me indicates we may have had a herd in this area. Bone beds like this uh, are a pretty good indication that many of the prey species for animals like Tyrannosaurus rex were in fact herding animals. These uh, animals uh, were herding probably because they were moving from region to region uh, as food resources changed over the course of the year. Uh, I would suspect that the Tyrannosaurs were in fact following these herds and that the old individuals and that the young individuals that strayed too far from the herds were the most likely prey for the Tyrannosaurs and these are the animals they actively hunted down. The discoveries of the past century have made Tyrannosaurus rex one of the most famous and the most fearsome of nature's creations. But how did such a ferocious giant come into being? Where does it fit in the history of life on Earth? Today we know that T. rex's ancestry can be traced back to a tiny creature whose skull can fit into the palm of your hand. This is Eoraptor, or the Dawn Stealer. It's the oldest and first predatory dinosaur that we know of in the fossil record. And it has some of the uh, basic adaptations that were to carry predatory dinosaurs uh, through 150 million years of evolution to something like the Tyrannosaurus behind me. The skull shows some of the classic features of the predatory dinosaurs. Uh, one of those features involves the lower jaw. At a, the midpoint of the lower jaw, 
there's a joint that allowed the lower jaw to flex, uh, like a flexible joint that if something was caught in the jaws, those jaws would clamp around uh, something that might be a live prey item. And this kind of a lower jaw is present in Tyrannosaurus, it's present in every other predatory dinosaur that we know of. And Eoraptor is the first to show that adaptation in the fossil record. The body plan road tested in Eoraptor became an evolutionary bestseller. Even today's birds, themselves thought to be modified dinosaurs, owe much of their design to these long-tailed ancestors. But how did T-Rex evolve from the size of a small dog into a 40-foot giant? For decades, many scientists thought it had to be descended from other giant predators like this Allosaurus, the last in a line of ever larger, ever toothier dinosaurs. This was the supercarnosaur hypothesis. It may have seemed obvious, but it was wrong. We used to have very simple views about how the different groups of meat-eating dinosaurs were related to each other. In recent years, though, as we've discovered more and more about the anatomy, these views have changed. Tyrannosaurus at one time was considered to be a carnosaur, that is, one of the large meat-eating forms and by its size, it was related to animals like Allosaurus. But in recent years, as we started to look more closely at the anatomy, there were a lot of things about Tyrannosaurs that did not fit that picture. One example is the foot. And if we look at this uh, pinched out third toe, in fact, this is the kind of characteristic we see in many of the other late Cretaceous dinosaurs, but all of them are small dinosaurs. They're not these big meat eaters that we're so familiar with, animals like Allosaurus. Looking at the foot and a whole suite of other characters in the skeleton, we now realize that Tyrannosaurs are in fact small meat eating dinosaurs that have grown extremely large and they're not related to the other meat eating dinosaurs that are large at all. Anatomical detective work can easily identify dinosaurs to whom T. rex is not related. But tracing its family tree back through time is more difficult. A huge gap in the fossil record precedes the sudden appearance of T. rex's first large predecessor. But recently, some of the missing clues have been found 4,000 feet up in the mountains of Alberta, Canada, on a prehistoric beach frozen in time, thrust on its side over millions of years. The richest dinosaur footprint site in all of Canada is in a coal mine in Grand Cache, Alberta. In these hundred million year old rocks, we have evidence of uh, armored dinosaurs, uh, meat-eating dinosaurs of different kinds, and large plant-eating dinosaurs. The footprints are all in trackways and they go across this uh, enormous cliff face, which at one time must have been a mud flat at the edge of the sea. What's important about this site is that because of the age, 100 million years ago, uh, we don't have equivalent bone sites in this part of the world. And so we have to do a little bit of guesswork in terms of identifying the dinosaurs. And I don't think there's any question at all that these are not Tyrannosaur tracks, but their long slender toes suggest to me that these were made by giant Salurosaurs. And we feel these days that giant Salurosaurs may have been the ancestor of Tyrannosaurus rex. The Salurosaur was a turning point in the evolution of Tyrannosaurus rex. Unlike other small predators of its time, 
It used its jaws rather than its front limbs for killing its victims. That adaptation would set the stage for the rise of T-Rex and its unique appearance. The earliest of the Tyrannosaur family is called Electrosaurus. It is a long, slender animal with relatively long front limbs. By the time Albertosaurus evolved, its head was larger and its front limbs shorter. There were certainly many species of Tyrannosaurus. We at present know of more than half a dozen species. 